Hi guys. I do realize you're probably very sick of my voice, so thank you for listening if you are. And please hang in there and uh, listen to the whole thing if you can. I would appreciate it. I just don't want to take class time to talk about something that actually is quite important. So I'm posting this video, hoping you'll find the time to listen to it. And I'm hoping it'll be a teachable moment for everybody involved. Uh, as you probably know, this is a new venture for CTN and Tina, sort of doing a hybrid uh, format. And it's obviously new to me. I'm conforming my format to a hybrid, I mean, my content to a hybrid format. So there's been a huge learning curve and I think it's getting slicker and slicker. And uh, we're all guinea pigs. So I, I hope we're, you know, all on board in that spirit. Having said that, you know, I, I've said in class, you know, the joy of teaching this particular class at Art Center was just kind of seeing these amazing voices click and literally just seeing all the interpretations of a given story, these entire worlds that come out of people. So it's felt very safe in the past and very um, nurturing of the creative process, very supportive of uh, individuals' relationships with the creative process, just a safe space in which to take risks and create. I might be naive, but I actually felt we were settling into that. I felt that the class just had a great vibe and it's energizing to me and it's inspiring to me. And I naively assumed that was the case across the board. It's come to my attention that some of the words I've used during the course, sorry, there's leaf floors going on outside and actually my air conditioner is really hot. So forgive the background noise in the form of the air conditioner and now the leaf blowers, but I'm gonna keep going here. Um, basically it's come to my attention and I wanna be real specific. Uh, this is a learning, opportunity, a teachable moment, and I'll tell you what my takeaway is at the very end, you know, how I can conform my approach to better accommodate people. But first, I just want to be real specific about the issue that's come up. So it's been brought to my attention that some of the words I've been using may lack context. So I'm kind of aware of that when I talk about, you know, Chevrolet's laws of color theory or gestalt studies, but I try to, you know, give enough context so that it lands. But I'm aware there's always room, right? With all of our different backgrounds and experience levels, there's always room for kind of missing dots in the equation. I'm aware of that. I try to repeat things enough and over the course of the 14 weeks, things will come up again and again and the context will be provided. I also drop, you might have noticed, gentle hints of things that can be Googled or researched. With, with all that said, um, the specific issue that was brought to Tina's attention and then mine was some words that I used when discussing, you may remember, we did a whole section on uh, New Guinean fertility gods, African masks, and Wakan wood sculpture. So the term I used in discussing the folk art was regional folk art. Not problematic in and of itself. It talked about the tr traditions behind them. So the purpose in bringing that up, you may remember, was in the character design discussion, we were talking about kind of looking at the exterior form of a shape and then thinking of it as a, as a canvas and breaking up that space in a way that excites the eye as one might do applying the golden mean. I offered, as I often have in my teaching, that there are entire traditions like African masks in which from generation to generation, a certain grid has become the norm. It's become the convention. And the grid is specifically meant to break up the space in a way that is interesting to the eye and creates a focal point and does a number of other things. So again, I, I, the term I used was regional folk art. Again, New Guinean, African, and Oaxacan, three different cultures. So indigenous peoples have these ongoing traditions that are passed from one generation to the next. In that discussion, if I use terms like crafts, craftsmanship or craft or artisan, those in and of themselves can seem elitist and demeaning, right? Every word has a connotation, a cultural relativity, nuance due to context. That's the nature of language. It's not a science, it's figurative by nature. So I'm aware of that in my teaching and I'm very thoughtful, believe it or not, about the words I choose. I happen to have a brother-in-law who's a communications professor and has been teaching communications for literally 35 years. My former roommate is a sociology and anthropology professor. So I've actually run a lot of this by him. He specializes in indigenous cultures. The words that were apparently potentially problematic were the words crude and naive. 
I just want to clarify, for those of us that have an art education, in an academic context, the word naive in and of itself refers to spatial sophistication. So naive and sophisticated are words that are regularly used in the milieu of art history and art analysis in academia to refer to spatial sophistication. So when I used the word crude, it had zero to do with the artisans and craftsmen that created the work, nor did it have anything to do with the ethnic subculture with which it was associated. It refers to spatial sophistication only. The word crude in art history and in art circles, in art speak, you often hear crudely tooled, finely tooled as opposite ends of a spectrum. So we're talking about woodworking specifically. A synonym for crudely tooled is rough hewn. You can apply that to a spoon. There's a whole tradition of sculpting spoons. You can refer it to woodworking and carpentry. You can apply it to Oaxacan wood sculpture. Again, nothing to do with the artisans or craftsmen that created it, not disparaging to them, nor is it disparaging or demeaning to the ethnic subculture with which it's associated. So I hope you follow me. There might be a missing bit of context in the form of art education that creates room for error, creates room for miscommunication. So I hope that those examples make sense. We've talked endlessly about Mulan. I've used the word Eastern. Again, you go to Jansen's art history books, you're often, often gonna see Judeo-Christian, tradition juxtaposed against Eastern tradition. You can see Western European traditions and conventions juxtaposed with Eastern. To speak about regional folk art in and of itself, it's a generic term, it's not inherently problematic. To speak about crude or naive, that's an art term that has zero to do with the ethnicity or subculture. So I just want to be clear, at Art Center, I am at the forefront of diversity and inclusion. I've been to every meeting to do with sensitivity, diversity, and inclusion in academia. As I said, my brother-in-law is a communications professor. We talk about this stuff all day, every day. My former roommate is a specialist in indigenous cultures. He teaches sociology and anthropology. He knows what the current academic speak is. We're not talking about political correctness. We're not talking about woke culture. We're talking about precise, accurate language. So to make this, uh, you know, to generalize this and bring it back into the context of filmed entertainment, I really do think there's a valuable conversation here. I want to point out that as a gay man, I spent my entire life looking to identify and see myself represented on screen. Anyone in a marginalized subculture identifies with that desire to see oneself represented on screen. Just imagine how frustrating it's been for 54 years to see the blatant stereotypes perpetuated, to see very damaging tropes perpetuated. I want to recommend a film called Celluloid Closet. It follows LGBTQ2 plus representation throughout film history. Ironically, the very first motion picture captured by Edison was two men dancing. Didn't mean anything about their sexual orientation or their uh, gender identity or their sexuality, none of that. It was just two men dancing. One of the first Oscar contenders uh, in the silent film era, which I mentioned, is Wings. It showed two men kissing. And in that cultural context, it was a non-issue. Nobody batted an eye. Only in the 30s, did the FCC step in and start censoring. So Cellular Closet is an amazing documentary about how art still continues to reflect life, how there's still gay characters, but it's very sublimated. Throughout the 50s, every last Tennessee Williams film was made in, I'm sorry, a play was made into a film. But for decades, you could have a gay character as long as they were the first ones with their throat slit, as long as they were also a murderer or otherwise schmarmy, right? As long as they're the first one thrown out the window, if you're talking about a Mel Gibson film, to the cheers of the audience. It's very frustrating to see inaccurate representation. I know it firsthand. I'm Italian American. Imagine all the mafia films I've seen in my time telling me my people are nothing but mafiosos. So I am invested in this. I'm invested in tolerance across the board. 
I'm invested in not positive representation, but accurate representation. Diversity and inclusion. Every breath of me and what I have to offer in the world and my purpose and my ministry and my mission has to do with tolerance, representation, diversity, and inclusion. One can only be so careful about one's wording. I actually now understand why more people are leaving the teaching profession than ever. If you watch the news, you know what a delicate, del I mean, teaching has always been a thankless job. And it's a lot of responsibility. Being a teacher is a lot of responsibility. So I think we're wise culturally to audit, to police, to hold teachers to a high standard. But I just think it may be a little overboard at this moment, considering again, more teachers are leaving the profession than ever, and there's a huge need for teachers. I actually now understand it. I am not gonna let this take the wind out of my sails. I'm gonna continue giving 110%. You hopefully see that I'm giving all. Uh, may or may not be worth it in terms of compensation, but I have been posting demos and videos online in the Discord. Uh, sadly, I can't spend extra time after class, which is my normal MO, because I gotta get home to the dog. But I am not gonna let this take away my enthusiasm and I'm gonna continue giving 110%. I guess I wanna offer the idea that language is figurative by nature. Stay with me for a second. You know, the words crude and naive that I used, I also used words like minimalist, interpretive, reductionist. Again, these are well-established terms to do with different types of stylization. There can be absolutely be an, an elitist connotation to some of them. Even words like highbrow and lowbrow, that's a great example. You're gonna hear that in the animation industry all the time, highbrow and lowbrow. If somebody chooses to wear that lens and be offended by it, lowbrow could be disparaging to middle America. But these conversations go on, especially among creative execs in determining their core audience, etc., etc. So the level of maturity has to do with recognizing language is inherently figurative by nature. Every word one could choose has not only a connotation that depends on context 100%, but it has cultural relativity. So language is meant to be figurative for a reason. That's the power of language. That's the power of storytelling to bring it back around to the whole purpose of the program. So I really feel strongly that the creative process suffers when there's too much censorship and editing. And that unfortunately is typical of today's cancel culture. We're editing ourselves right and left. So I would encourage everybody to lighten up and understand the figurative function of language. There's always cultural context, cultural relativity, connotations, positive and negative, that depend on context. So when we talk about art, any term you could choose, reductionist, minimalism, again, highbrow, lowbrow, crude, naive, all of those words could be offensive if one chose, you know what I mean, to walk around with that lens. It's not gonna serve you in the studio system in a collaborative medium like film. That's my best advice to you. So again, I of course don't have time to go back and watch literally every single moment of these videos, but it's very transparent. I mean, we uh, there's a lot of ears right there in the room. I'm very aware of what I say because of all the ears. My colleagues and contemporaries are out in cyberspace. I mean, it's available to the entire world. So I've been pretty precise about my language. But on that front, you know, without reviewing all the tapes, my recollection is we have one project in the class that's set in China. That was the twist that this student put on. We have one that's set in India. I have used the blanket term Eastern in certain cases. If that's offensive, I do apologize. But I do know you know, there's a long-standing tradition with art history alone of sort of contrasting Eastern tradition with Judeo-Christian tradition or Western European tradition. I didn't invent those schools of thought, but I apologize if they're offensive. Um, and again, it is a blanket term, Eastern. It doesn't honor or do justice to any one culture. I understand that. Uh, but these conversations do go on in the trenches, and that's kind of what I wanted to impart in bringing it back to like an entertainment context and making it a teachable moment. And when I said level of maturity, here's what I'm getting at. 
again, in discussing Mulan, I didn't want to walk on eggshells. I wanted to share my experience in the trenches of hearing the art direction discussed. So when I mentioned woodblock prints, watercolors, Chinese letter forms, if any of it was disparaging, I apologize, but these were the conversations that went on. I will say Disney has, you know, been uh, under fire many times for not doing it right, right? For not, for offending given ethnic groups or cultures. So these conversations about ethnicity and what makes a character look a certain way, they just happen. There's no way around it. So nobody's walking on eggshells. Again, if I had to be offended by the inaccurate representation of my peeps, the gay community, I mean, I would have switched planets a long time ago. I would have gone to Mars. So it's all, you got to pick your battles is my opinion. And uh, just know these conversations do go on in the trenches and it's not a delicate topic. I'm a big fan of epigenetics. So I don't know if you know, you know, what they're discovering in epigenetics recently. But we are, just in my worldview, we are responsible for being at the cutting edge of thought forms. And that is actually what gets passed on to future generations. So we always need to be transforming and evolving individually and then on the macro level. We all need to be contributing to our collective evolution. That includes accurate language. That includes language that accounts for the experiences of others unlike ourselves. So I do think, you know, for example, if some of you are greener artists and you're not out there working in the field yet, I support you in continuing to improve the language, if that makes sense. But I also think you could um, pick your battles and I think you could recognize an ally when you have one. And as a gay man in a very marginalized community and an Italian American who has spent his entire life resenting the mafiosos I see on screen, I'm asking you to recognize me as an ally. But I am asking for a little bit of maturity, to be honest, a sense of humor and maturity. And also a little bit of responsibility here. If the art education that would provide the context for the terms I just mentioned is missing, Maybe own that and don't be quick to indict me. That's what I would ask of you. On my end, I can slow down. I can slow down and stop trying to pack all the content from a five hour class into a three hour window. That way I can actually be more precise about my words. I will not walk on eggshells because I know my worldview and I know there's nothing controversial there. But I can just simply slow down. I'm always considerate about the words I choose, but I can be even more so. And that's my takeaway. Okay, thank you for listening. And uh, I just, I want to feel great about this class. And uh, thanks for listening. I'll just leave it at that. Bye, guys. I'll see you next Tuesday.
Um, very blessed on that front. I am at the forefront of diversity and inclusion at Art Center. So you may know, and I've mentioned it, we have a lot of international students from a variety of backgrounds. Um, so I've been in every department meeting to do with diversity and inclusion. Personally, my own brand has to do with positive representation, of course, promoting tolerance, specifically for the LGBTQ2 plus community. And everything I do is toward the end of improving the representation and the inclusion of marginalized groups. So it's ironic I'm being sort of called to the carpet, and that's what I want to talk about. 